If you are new with us, I just want to say welcome. We're uh, so glad to have you. And we're kind of beginning this year off really trying to ask and expect more of these kind of moments. I don't know your experience with church. I don't know if you're, maybe this is the first time you've been in church in a long time. Maybe someone invited you. You just showed up. Maybe church has been a part of your life in some, in some way for maybe decades. And I, I think we all kind of maybe just have this base understanding. I know what it means to go to church, but I, I really want us as we begin this year to, to ask how do we make the most of these moments? If we're gonna be together for 100, 200 plus hours as a community, connecting, meeting with each other and with God, here's what I want. I wanna grow and change. I wanna see it, it produce something in my life. I don't wanna just show up as a routine because that's what my parents had me do when I was a kid. Now I'm gonna do it with my kids. I want it to mean more than that, and I hope you do too. And so we... We're beginning this year in this series. We're asking this question, how do I go to church? Sunday best, how to really go to church. And I don't say that if you're someone who's been in church a long time. I'm not, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I'm not trying to kind of say you don't know how to go to church because there's a lot of us, like maybe, maybe we've gone to church for decades. But you know what I have discovered? And maybe this is the part that's harder for those of us, and like me, who have gone to church for years. I mean, we're talking, I've, I've been to church more times than I could count in my life. Is I find that sometimes you can go so long, do something so often that it becomes a habit that you don't even think about what you're doing. We know this in life. Have, have you ever, um, have you ever, uh, driven home from work or school and you forgot the drive at all, like you don't remember, you don't remember, like did I stop at that four-way stop? Oh my gosh, I hope no one was there. I might have run, right? Uh, did I run a red light? Like you can't even remember the drive home. You know why? It's because scientists have discovered that God created our brains that when we do something over and over, that the neurons actually build a network in your brain, a highway, so to speak, so that you can do it without even thinking about it. That's why some of you are so good at something because you've done it over and over, you don't even have to think about it, right? But now, listen, here's the danger. Some of you have been in church so much, you've gone to church maybe every Sunday of most of your entire life that you don't even realize how much it might be a habit where you don't get anything new out of it. I know I should go to church. Yeah, that's not a good enough reason for me. I wanna be here and experience something. I wanna connect with God. I want my life to change. Is there anybody here that wants that this year out of coming to church? I don't wanna just show up, spend an hour, an hour and a half of my life and go and nothing ever change. I, 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 want, I wanna grow and develop. And so that's why we're talking about how do I really go to church? Now if you were here last week, I, I began this series talking about before you get to church. How do you have an expectant spirit when you show up? It, it changes everything. Today what I wanna do is I wanna talk about what we just did. I wanna talk about the portion of the gathering, the experience, the service, where we come in and there's music and we all sing, or some of us sing, but it's the moment where we all gather, and here's what we call it in our church world, just so you know. We call it, that's the worship. You ever heard that term? That term's awfully loosely used to talk about the portion where we sing and where we sing songs. I wanna talk about that. Now, if you're not familiar with church, maybe you didn't really have a church background until someone invited you, maybe you came here. You didn't know what to expect. And you show up, you walk in, and all of a sudden, it gets dark, and the band starts playing really loud, and there's people up on the platform, and they're jumping around, and it look like, well, they've been up for three hours and had a lot of coffee. And, and, you're, and you wonder, like, why do we do this? I want to talk about that. Why do we do that to kick off our gatherings? Can we just all agree? We don't really do that in pretty much any place else in life. Like, like we don't gather with friends. We don't go to a spin class and everybody gets on their cycles and the instructors start, hey, before we get started today, we're just going to sing a few choruses of Firm Foundations. This is going to be so good. That, that won't happen at the gym, I bet. I bet, you know. We don't go over to a friend's house for a dinner party and you bring a casserole to participate and you walk in and then they kind of get all the food out and then they're like, okay guys, hey, before we eat, we're all just gonna, I'm gonna flip on Sonos and we're all just gonna sing a few songs here to get started. We don't do that, that would be awkward, right? 
Why is it that it's so much a part of what we do in the church, right? I, here's why. Because I believe that these kind of moments, these gatherings, two things happen. One is you come in and you receive something from God, right? You come in and hopefully it's inspiring, hopefully it's educating, you, hopefully it's moving you, hopefully it's changing. We receive something, but listen, we also come to bring something. We don't just come to receive, we come to bring something. And let me just say this. I believe that the greatest thing that you and I will ever be able to give to God is our praise and worship. I believe it is of the highest value in the kingdom. Over anything else, if God says, if you would bring your praise and your worship to me, I think it means the most to God. So I, I want to talk about it. What is worship? What is praise? Why do we use these different words? Well, let me see if I can just kind of um, break this down. This is kind of maybe how I see this. Worship, to me, is the internal position of your heart toward God. So what is worship? It's the internal, like you can kind of worship sometimes on the inside. It's, it's when your heart is inclined toward God. It's leaning toward God. It's like, God, I recognize how good you are, great you are, so I want to follow you. Worship is like this internal motivating, it's my position, my, my position toward God. That's worship. Now what is praise? It's connected. Praise to me is the external expression of your heart toward God. Praise is, is not the silent, quiet one. It is when you actually express the worship that is in your heart, okay? Does that make sense? And so there's worship, there's praise, and, and here's what I, I can tell you just from my own personal experience. I feel the closest to God, just me, in moments of worship and praise. I don't know if any of you feel that way. I feel more connected to God than any, even reading my Bible, studying it, can I be honest, even praying, that when we get into an atmosphere like this and the music, it just overwhelms me and the songs and the lyrics get me to think about God and the inside worship and praise, something about that enables me to connect with God on the deepest level. And so I think it's really powerful. And if you are like, maybe you come here, I just don't know what to do. Maybe the environment you grew up in, it was just we came in and we sit there and we just sang some hymns. We, we just did sit up, stand down. You know, we, we did this kind of religious thing. But, but I see other people that seem like they're in a moment. And you say, I want that. I believe that we can all experience that. And so I want to talk about ways to praise. In fact, when I was at a conference a few years ago, I heard this pastor in like a brief like 15-minute segment I heard this pastor talk about, and I didn't even know this, that there are seven different unique words for praise in the Old Testament. Not just one. We just use one word. Seven different Hebrew words that all seem to express what praise is. And so today what I want to do is I, I want to kind of unpack these seven, and then we're going we're gonna to practice it. What does it mean to praise God? Now, if you were at the last worship night, you got a little taste of this. But I found I could use this over and over again. And so what does it look like to praise God? Seven different ways. I hope this expands your understanding of what we do when we gather on Sunday morning. The first one, the first word, is the word halal. Halal. I want everybody to say it out loud with me when I count to three. One, two, three. Halal. Let's do it again. One, two, three. Halal. Okay. Now this word for praise is used more than 150 times. It's used a lot. Okay, it's a real popular one throughout the Psalms. And here's the definition of halal. Halal means to shine, to make a show, to boast, to celebrate. I like this part. To make a fool of, to act mad. That's a pretty funny definition for praise, right? Here's a, a great uh, place we find it. Psalm 113, verses 1 through 3 says this. It says, halal the Lord. That's the word. Everywhere you see underline, that's the word. I'm helping you find it. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. I love this picture. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be what? Is to be halal. It's to be praised. I, I love the imagery that we get right here of as long as the sun is shining, as long as we have light, as long as we're awake, 
We should praise the Lord. By the way, this word halal, you may recognize is connected to a word that sometimes you've been around church, we come, sometimes feels a little bit churchy word, but the word hallelujah. It's actually a root, it means praise Yahweh. It means hala, halal, Yahweh, praise the Lord. That's what that word means, by the way, halal. And so I don't know what you picture when you hear the definition of halal. But you know what I picture? I picture going to an Ohio State football game. How many of you ever been to an Ohio State football game? Raise your hand if you've been to one. Okay, yeah. How many have ever maybe been to a professional game, like say go see the Bengals or the Browns? Probably not, really the Browns. I mean, that's not really, you know, you know. I would, I would mention the Browns, but they didn't make the playoffs. Anyways, so if you've ever been to a football game, let's be honest, and I don't really see this in high school, but you see this in college and pro. There's always some, what we would consider crazy people. They're the ones that it'll be 20 degrees and they have their shirt off, right? And they sometimes paint themselves. And what do they do? They make a fool of them, so that's what, right? But everybody else is, so it's not a big deal, right? And they're crazy. And when their team scores, what do they do? They go, ah! They throw their hands up and they cheer and they pound on the seat in front of them and they act crazy whenever their team scores a goal. This is halal. It's what it means to praise God, right? And you know what's funny is some of you, based on your experience in church, some of you, as you hear that, you go, that's not church. No, when we go to church, I, I go to stand and immobile, reverent before God. I know, because sometimes I look around. I know I should be singing, but I can't help it. Sometimes I look around, and some of you just sit. Maybe you can't get up. If you can't get up, that's another thing. But well, some of you sit. Some of you look like you're not awake. Some of you, I'm afraid, like if, I, if, if somebody just touched you, you fall over. And it's like, I'm so immobile. But, but we've got this idea. Let's be honest, some of us, how we grew up. They, going to church, worship is, is serene, it's calm, it's centered. It's that. Now, listen, that can be part of it, but you have to understand, there's a form. It was used over 150 times, this idea of praise that is a little bit crazy. It's a little bit big. I want you to, it's why when you show up and the first thing that happens when the lights come on is you got a band and you got singers and they're excited and you got people like Tucker doing high knees and everybody else is going, uh, uh. Look at them. They look so excited. <laughs> it's not for show. It's not performance. If you think this is performance, let me just tell you, it's only performance when you don't participate. What that is, is that's halal. That's praising God. That's like King David when they brought the Ark of the Covenant back into his town. He was so excited that the blessing of the presence of God was now with them that David couldn't help himself. And he danced with all of his might before everyone else. And he did not care. He made a fool of himself. And by the way, we show up at church and the only reason why it ever feels awkward to make a fool of yourself is when nobody else around you does it. But when you go to a football game and everybody's going nuts around you, it doesn't matter when the, your team scores, you jump off the couch at home and you're high and everybody jumping around. Listen, you can bring that same energy to God. Don't just give that to your favorite football team. We should give that to God. Hello, hello. Let me, let me give you another word, okay? Another word is the word tehillah, tehillah. I don't know what you think of, but dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Tehillah. Isn't that, isn't that how the song goes? You won't forget that one. Tehillah. What does Tehillah mean? Tehillah means this. It's a song or hymn of praise. A song. Tehillah is the actual song. So listen, if halal, and by the way, they kind of share the same root, the same root word, tehillah, halal, okay? If halal is the verb, it's the expression, it's the big, it's the, it's the moving around, it's the clapping, it's the celebrating. If that's the verb, tehillah is the noun. It's the actual song that we sing. 
is the words that come off our lips. That's the tehillah to the Lord. I love Psalm verse 40, uh, Psalm chapter 40, verse 3. It says this, he, being God, put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise, that's a hymn of Tehillah, uh, that's the actual song, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. In other words, it's this idea that God is so good and he's so worthy that, and he's worth, that I need to write a song about him. It, it's, that's why when you gather and we sing songs, do you know what we sing? We don't sing about ourselves most of the time. We sing about God. We sing about God's grace, his amazing grace. We sing about God's mercy. We sing about his love. We sing about his faithfulness. We sing about his healing. We sing about the nature of God. He's so good. He's so awesome, so powerful. We ought to write a song about him. A tahila, write a song, which by the way is, is why even in, in the church world, you come in, if you're new, you may come in and go, I've never heard these songs before. I listen to a lot of music, I've never heard them before. It's because we're writing new songs all the time. In this house, we're writing new songs all the time. If you're new, we just put out an album last fall called Second Wind. There's songs that are meaningful out of what God's doing in this house, and we're, we're called to continually write new songs and to ha- sing a new song before the Lord, a tehillah. And you know my hope and prayer is? My hope and prayer is that when you show up on Sunday and you engage and you hear these songs that will grab your attention and move you, my hope is that they'll get stuck in your head. You ever get a song stuck in your head you can't get out? There's nothing worse than when it's Bieber. You know what I mean? Like when you say, oh, I can get that song out of my head. You know what I mean? Do you know what my hope is? My hope is that when you leave here on Sunday, that there's a line, there's a melody, there's a chorus. There's a song that just gets stuck in your head and you just replay it over and over like, I can't get that song out of my head. Listen, I actually think that there's a beautiful picture that, that when we gather to worship, it's not just what you do for one hour every single week, but it's something to be upon your lips all throughout the week. I, I love what Psalm 34 verse one says. It says, I will praise the Lord at all times in his tehillah. His song, his praise is always on my lips. So hello, the expression, I'm gonna be crazy, I'm gonna worship God with everything in me. And Tehillah is the song that I give to God. Now, the next two words I'm gonna give you, you have to use your hands. So I want you, everybody take your hands and just kind of like this, just get them going, just loosen them up. You're gonna need, you're gonna need your, your hands. Okay, this next word I wanna teach you is the word yada. Yada, on the count of three, let's all say it together. One, two, three, yada, yada. Here's what yada means. It means to revere or worship with extended hands. It comes from the Hebrew word um, yad, Y-A-D, that means hand, okay? It's this idea of using your hands, like the, the, the yada is hand and Jehovah, it's, it's, I'm using my hands of confession and praising God with extended hands. Now listen, may, maybe you're new to a church environment where people raise their hands. And maybe it makes you feel a little weird at first. Maybe you see people with their hands raised and maybe you grew up in church and you're like, I'm not a hand raiser. You know some of you feel that way. I don't do that, that's weird. There might be, but I, I'm not a hand raiser. I get that, I get that. And I can appreciate some different traditions we're from. Maybe that never happened. But can I just tell you, if that, is your, um, if that is your mindset coming into a moment like this, you could be missing out on something that's really powerful. And you didn't even realize it. There's a beautiful picture of how important and how powerful it can be just to raise your hands in the middle of a battle. In Exodus chapter 17, we have this moment where the Israelites had just come out of Egypt and slavery, Moses leading them out. And Moses and the Israelites are in the wilderness when all of a sudden they get attacked by the Amalekites, a nation that did not, they were threatened by them. They weren't coming to fight them, but the Amalekites came to fight them. And so without any option, Moses takes Joshua and all of the men to go into battle. Now you gotta remember, these are not trained military men, okay? They're bricklayers. They were people that were forced to do slave labor in Egypt. And so Moses tells, tells Joshua, you go into battle, this is real nice, right, when you're the leader. You go into battle, I'm gonna go up on a mountain and watch, okay? But what Moses did, I think he went up there to pray. 
I think he went up there to have a moment with God. And so while Moses is on top of the mountains, you know what he discovered? This, and I don't even know how you discover this, but Moses discovered as long as he had his hands raised before God in heaven, that the Israelites won the battle. You know, whenever he put his hands down, they started to lose. I don't even know how you figure that out. It's like you put your hands up. Yeah, I'll kill them. Oh, we're killing them. I'm tired. Put my arms down. Oh, gosh, we're getting beat. Oh, he won. look, we just killed five. Oh, we're going to be. I, I don't know how, but they discovered, and, and I think there was something, there's something to it, that Moses, as long as he was worshiping God with his hands raised, God was giving him victory. So much so that his two friends, Aaron and Hur, when he got tired, they just kind of held. So here's what I would love for us all to do. If you, could you just, wherever you are, could you just hold your hands up like this? We're all going to do it, so you don't have to feel weird. Okay. I want to see how long you can do this. So for the rest of the message, would you just hold your hands up? Like, I'm just kidding. You never make it. Do you know that, listen, that um, scientists and sociologists have discovered that there's a power in your life for raising your hands? They've discovered this. This is not even faith-based or any of this. I, in fact, there was a TED Talk I was watching where they did a study. You know what they discovered? They discovered that people who, who open up their posture, who extend their hands, they go big. You know how like when you cross the finish line and you win and you put your hands up? They found that people who are blind, who have never seen that ever done before, when they win, they naturally stick their hands up. Did you know that? There's some, I mean, there's something in us that naturally wants to do this. They have found that when we take a posture like this, our confidence grows. Something inside of us mentally begins to shift just like this. And yet when we stay closed up and small, we actually think we're small. There's, there's a power to this. And I love what Psalm 9 verse 1 says, okay? It says this, I will praise you. And that word praise is yada. I will lift my hands to you, Lord. Notice how he says, with all my heart. I will tell of all the marvelous things that you have done. It's this idea, I cannot praise God, just reach out. I've got to give him all of me. I, I gotta extend my hands to him, all of it. Now, I, I know some of you, and, and I understand this. Because the first time I was in an environment where, where someone said, the pastor said, hey, I want you to lift your hands. You know, I'm like, I'm not a hand raiser. And so the first time I ever did it, it was like this. It was like this. No one sees. I got it down low, right? No one sees. And then over time, as I, I would feel more and more comfortable what am I doing? Expressing my praise to God. That would kind of, oh. And then just be like this. Mm, my hands are like this. Get to this point. And then every once in a while, I was like, hey, extend your hand. And I was like, oh, you know, I got a little bit, a little one-hander. Just a one-hander. Just like, just like a one-hander like this. And, and, and then after a while, what you'll find is raising your hands gives you a confidence and a boldness to know, listen, that, that you're in the presence of God. Now, why, what else does this symbolize? Surrender. Why, why do we do this is because we're actually saying when we come into the presence of God, God, I surrender to you. And I just want you to hear this. I believe sometimes the greatest praise that you will give is when you're in the middle of a battle. When you're dealing with something, when you're walking through something, a health scare, when, when you're dealing with some family issue, when you're going through a season where, where the finances are dry, when you're in that kind of place, can I tell you, maybe the greatest thing you could ever do in that moment is to praise God in the middle of the battle and watch if he doesn't give you a victory in your life. Yada. Everybody say yada. Yada. I want to yada the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me give you another one. This one's also connected to the hands, and that is the word toda. Toda. I want you to all say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Toda. What is toda? Toda means this, to offer praise through confession or thanksgiving and often with your hands. Again, this is using, they're using your hands as a form of praise, but this one has a little bit of a twist, okay? If yada is raising your hands out of revelry for God, toda is about lifting your hands in a moment of thanksgiving, in a moment of confession and thanking God you're good. God, I'm so thankful for you. I love this passage, Psalm 100. It's a popular one. Psalm 100, verse 4. It says, enter his gates with what? Say that word, with thanks. Enter his gates with toda. That's the word toda. 
and enter his, to his courts, go into his courts with praise, tehillah, a song. Enter his, what do we do? Enter his gates with todah. We are to sing a song as we come into his presence, give thanks to him, and praise his name. I, I love Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this passage. It's kind of fun. He says, basically, approach God with the password, thank you. When you approach God, you should do it with a posture of gratitude. You should come to God and say, God, I am so thankful for all that you've done in my life. And one of the things that you can do is a check on your own spirit. Here's what I've discovered is when we are often sometimes really negative in our life, I would argue it's because we're not to dying enough. We're not thanking God enough. You know, we show up sometimes, I get this, we'll show up at church sometimes and we'll have all kinds of problems and work was difficult this week and I've had a fight with my spouse and all of these things and so we come in and we can just feel so negative, disappointed, anxious about life. Do you know what you should do in those kind of moments? Stop and thank God for what he's done. See, I believe that you can thank God for what he's done in the past. We forget, but we should. Thank God for what he's done, but then listen, here's another really powerful form of this. Also, you should thank God for what he hasn't yet done. There's something about faith when you offer your prayers. If, if you've been joining us in prayer and fasting, there are things that I'm praying with a boldness. God, I need you to move in my situation. I need an answer. Do you know what might actually release God when he sees your faith, is when you begin to thank God before you even have the answer. God, I don't know how it's gonna come, but I thank you that it is on its way. The heaven, you heard me. And listen, something begins to shift inside of us. And we take a posture of ta-da. God, I'm so thankful. Offering the thanks before you see it. That's faith. And by the way, there's a term sometimes you'll hear in church. It's this old term, it's called giving God a sacrifice of praise. Do you know what that means? I think sometimes we don't really register. Here's what it means to me. It's when you'll show up and don't feel like it, but you'll praise God anyways. It's when life was hell for the last month, but I'm gonna show up in this moment and I'm gonna still to dog God. I'm gonna still praise God. I'm gonna still thank God because he is good. Even though my situation's not good, he's good. And I know he's faithful. And I know he's gonna use all these things that are happening in my life for my good and his glory because that's what God does. And so I trust in that. So I'm gonna come and thank him anyways. A sacrifice of praise. And so you can use your hands. It's actually a beautiful part of praise and worship. Let me give you another one. I like this word. It's the word. You're going to need to get like deep into your throat for this one. A little bit of phlegm. Can you get a little, <clears throat> get a little phlegm? It's the word Shabbat. Shabbat. Say it all with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Shabbat. You got to, uh, you got to really get it. Shabbat. What does is, what is Shabbat mean? I love this definition. It's to address in a loud tone. To commend or to praise. How? Loudly. Not quiet. Loudly. Shabbat. Psalm 63 verses 2 and 3 says this. I have seen you in the sanctuary. I showed up in a moment where I experienced you, God, and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will shabbat. will glorify. will praise you. Listen, it's this idea that when you experience God, and I pray that you do this year, when you encounter God, when you encounter how good he is and his power, and when he touches your health and you prayed something during the fast and then God did something, you can't help yourself but Shabbat. It's okay to get loud. Can I just tell you, it's okay to sing loud. If you wonder sometimes why it is loud in here, it's to encourage you to sing loud and that way those around you don't have to suffer when you sing off key. Yeah. You know, um, there have been people throughout the years that have visited our church. And I've, they've literally found me after coming just once. And I've heard things like, um, I really like the message, Pastor. That's great. And I don't really like it, but it's just too loud. It's just too loud in here. 
and we've had challenges before with our speaker systems, and this room's much better, but um, it's big and kind of loud, but it's really not that loud. Just so you know, for the audio geeks in the space at Wonder, we run about 96 dB at the board. Now, if you don't know what I just said, that was Hebrew, so I will translate it later. <laughs> and if you think that's loud, you should go to a concert. This place ain't loud compared to going to concerts. I've been to some concerts. One time, I went to a Miley Cyrus concert. Don't ask. <laughs> we took our daughter, and she was like 12. That was a bad idea, by the way. Uh, I think there's only four guys in the entire place. I was there. Uh, really inappropriate. But it was so loud. You remember that, honey? It was so loud. Our ears literally felt like they were bleeding, okay? And, and, and some people are worried. It's kind of loud in here. I, it's big, but I just want you to know you will not sustain hearing loss here. You go to concerts, it'll run 103, 104, continuous. Sometimes peak at 110. Some say you have to be at 120 decibels of like constant noise for a certain amount of time for actually to do damage in your ears, all right? Some of you listen to music when you were younger so loud, you probably did damage your ears, okay? I get that, I get that. But what, I, what I'm saying is, if you wonder why is it loud, it's because it's scriptural, it's okay, and when you sing, can I just encourage you? We make it loud, it's great. Don't just sing about the goodness and the greatness of God, really. God's so good, God's so good, he's so good to you. Don't do that. If he's good, sing it. Put a little bit of wind behind it. Why don't you give him a loud response when he comes? And when we have an opportunity to praise God, you should be a little bit loud. And if you go, I just don't like church to be loud, I'm sorry, you might hate heaven. Because it will be loud in heaven. John got a picture of this when he shared the revelation with us. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Then I looked, this is John, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. There's so many of them, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was, was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousand, like, why couldn't you just say a bazillion, right? And thousands of thousands. Look at verse 12. What were they all doing together? Sing with a what kind of voice? A no, 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 come on. Say it with what kind of voice? A Shabbat voice. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. You can't say that quietly to God. Some things you just gotta be loud about. And yet, here's what I know. Some of you, by default, are not loud people. And that's okay. It's okay. It is. I, I think sometimes, though, we confuse maybe our personality or what makes us comfortable with this idea of what it looks like to really praise God for how good he is. Be careful not to do that because I think sometimes you get this idea that, you know, the people that really seem like they express themselves and they're singing and they don't care and they're loud. Okay, they must be extroverts, but I'm an introvert. I don't do that. This isn't about personality. Okay, don't, I, I want you to be authentic. Listen to me, I want you to be authentic in who you are. Worship God with an authentic heart, okay? But don't let that be an excuse for not actually praising God the way scripture tells us, the way we're gonna experience when we get to heaven. It's okay to sometimes just sing loudly. It's just okay to do that. And if people don't like it, they'll move. Make them move with your voice. God does not care if you're on pitch. And the rest of us do, but God does not. Okay, Shabbat. Everybody say Shabbat. Shabbat. Okay, let me give you another one. This next one, we're on the sixth word, is the word Barack. Obama. It's not. Kind of actually same origin, but Barack literally means to kneel down to bless. To kneel or to bless. It's used more than any of the other words, and it's not just confined to praise. It's used over 300 times, and you'll see even places where it'll say that the, the uh, camels came and knelt down, okay? So it's this picture of to kneel. Now, here's, here's a great passage, one that maybe you've heard if you've been in church. It's a wonderful one. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 3. It says to Barak the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. 
and all my inmost being praise his holy name. Barak the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Don't forget all that he's done, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. When, when I was growing up, I always heard the translation that said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. It means to bless, it means to honor and praise, but here's the picture, here's the picture. It's from the root word that means it's part of the knee. To kneel, to kneel. I, I want you to think about where do we have postures of kneeling? in our world and through culture. Do you know, and, and, and we don't so much in Western culture, I understand that, but do you know that there are still places around the, the globe and throughout time, whenever you came into the presence of royalty and majesty, a king, do you know what you would do? You'd come in and you would kneel. You would kneel. You would, you would what are you doing? You're lowering yourself as a sign to bless the one that you're in the presence of. There's something about, now we also know that this happens in our culture, right? Ladies, have you ever had a guy do this in front of you? You ever get a guy that will drop to his knee in front of you? You know what's about to happen, right? He's about to pull out a diamond. He's about to ask, will you marry me? What, guys, maybe you've never even thought why we do this, and maybe all the way back to this, but what is it? It's taking a posture of lowering yourself. I'm gonna ask for your hand in marriage. I am lowering myself. Also, this term, uh, to barak, to kneel, to, to bless, is also, you'll see the term, sometimes it's defined to salute. This past um, November, our family had a really cool experience my daughter Audrey, she enlisted in the Air National Guard, and it was a really, it was a cool moment. In fact, I think she has drill next weekend, and she's still in high school, okay? Airman Moore, she wants to be referred to that from now on, if you don't mind. And um, when we were there, it reminded me of growing up, and I, I spent a few years around the military when I was in high school. And I remember learning all the different rank and insignia, and one of the things you have to learn, you're in the military, right? When you see someone, an officer or someone who's a higher rank, and you go by them, what do you do? You salute. It's a sign of honor and respect. Listen, there's a part of what we do when we come to praise and worship God that what we're doing is we're lowering ourselves. Maybe to the point where you'll be in a moment with God. I, I want to free you. If you're here on a Sunday, oh, nobody does this. I don't care. It's part of a way that you can express your praise and worship. If you have ever been so, I have been so overwhelmed by the presence of God and he just feels bigger and bigger to me that I just sometimes, I just, all I wanna do is get on my knees before him. Can I just say it's okay to do that? That's a form of praise. It means something. God takes note, not just when we stand, but when we kneel in his presence. Barak, to kneel down or to bless, Okay. Now let me give you our last word. And for this, I'm gonna need some help. So I need the band to come out because I'm gonna need a little bit of help for this last word. This last word, the seventh word, the seven ways to praise is the word zamar. Zamar. You all say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Zamar. What does zamar mean? Zamar means this. To strike with your fingers. To play and make music accompanied with singing. All throughout the Psalms, and we even see David, who was one of the master songwriters, and, and as far back as there was something about music that moved people, that there was something about taking a song, and yes, throughout history, we've had things like canting and Gregorian cants and all this stuff, but can I just tell you, I think it takes songs to heal us to the next level when you add music, that something happens inside of us when we hear it. It's an expression of our praise. Psalm 98, verses four through six says this. Shout, that's like Shabbat. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in Zamar. Break out in praise to the Lord. It says break out in praise and sing for joy to sing your Zamar. Sing your song to the Lord with the harp. It says, with the harp and melodious song, with the trumpets and the sound of the ram's horn, make a joyful symphony before the Lord, the King. What, what are we called to do? We're not just called to gather and sing, but also to make music. 
Something powerful happens when all of a sudden the band comes and they start to play using the gifts that God's given them. And we hear the strings and people like Nick begin to tickle the strings. You're like, ah, oh, I wish I could do that. But have you ever noticed that something changes in the atmosphere? The moment the music starts, something can begin to change in your spirit. The moment you step into an atmosphere that is the presence of God, something begins to shift because I believe that God created us to encounter and to be moved by music. And it doesn't matter. Listen, I know we listen to all different kinds of music here. I know some of you jam to country, some of you to rock, some of you to hip hop, some of you to pop, some of you to worship music. Here's what I know, as human beings, we are moved deeply in the soul by music. And guess what? Maybe, just maybe, our creator is also moved deeply in his spirit when we begin to play music and sing songs that are joyful and melodious to the Lord. Something happens. Can I just tell you this? You don't only have to experience this once a week. I don't know how many of you put worship music on at home, but can I just encourage you when you're feeling defeated, when you just got another disappointment at work, when you're feeling like there's anger taking back over you, when you feel like you're losing in the battle of life, can I encourage you, stick some worship music on. Put it on your car. Put it on at your house. Watch how it begins to shift the atmosphere in your house. It's really hard to argue and yell at each other when there's worship music in that same space because music moves us. It moves us. You know what I found? When we come to gather in his presence, I know we're carrying things. I know a lot of times you guys are all, you got every, you're dealing with problems that I don't even know about, but they're heavy. But can I, can I just challenge all of us? Let's not just come into the presence of God to give him our problems. I, I know we do that. Sometimes in prayer and fasting, all I do is, God, here's my problem. Here's the thing I need you to fix. Here's the thing I need you. Here's the person I need you to heal. That's great. But can I encourage us? Let's not just come into the presence of God and bring our problems. Let's also bring our praise. Let's also bring our worship. Let's also bring the best that we have. And let's thank God. Let's toda God. Let's yada God. Let's halal and be crazy before God. Let's sing a tahila to God. Let's barak and get down on our knees. Let's shabak and get really loud. Let's Lamar put some music on and begin to sing and praise his name. Because listen, he is worthy of our praise. Is there anybody here that believes that today? Come on, stand up on your feet. We're not going to just talk about it. We're going to do it. And I want to challenge you. Maybe you've never lifted your hands. You've never clapped. You've never sung out loud. Let today be the day praise comes forth into your life. Not just an internal worship, but a praise, an external expression to God. I'm going to read Psalm 150. And then we're going to worship and praise God. And I want to encourage you. Maybe the first time ever you're going to lift your hands. Do it. Watch what begins to change in you. This is what we're called to do. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord, halal the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. We're in his house. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him, what? For his mighty works. Praise him for his unequal greatness. There's no one like him. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and the harp and the guitar and the bass. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. You can allow, you can get big. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thanks so much for tuning in to this message. I hope that it encouraged you and inspired your faith. If God is doing something in your life, would you take a moment and let us know? We wanna connect with you and we wanna be able to pray for you. All you have to do is shoot us an email to hello at the x.church or you can always send us a DM on one of our social media platforms. And if you know somebody that would also be encouraged by this very message, why not take a moment and just share it with them right now? 
And as always, I want to say thank you to every single person who so generously financially supports this ministry so we can continue to get messages like these out to people all over the world. We believe God is building something special and you're a significant part of it. Until next time, have a great day.